that is why we sing it. That the blood of Jesus Christ was the only one who was pure, undefiled from sin, the only one who could pay the penalty at Calvary. And today there is wonder-working power. Power to take a sinner and make them into a saint. Power to forgive and to cleanse and to heal. And God has brought you here tonight, not out of chance, but he's brought to you here to speak to you, uh, to convict your soul, that you would enter into a living relationship with him. And that's why we're going to sing the, the, about, more about the power of Jesus, was lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. <coughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to be here, and we deeply appreciate it. And um, we just trust that your heart is open to the voice of God, that you're listening for his voice and for what he has to say to you, that you'll forget about the person that's sitting beside you or in front of you, and that you'll concentrate on these songs and concentrate on what Louise will sing and what David will speak to you about. We're going to open our meeting with our opening hymn, It Was Down at the Cross Where My Saviour Down. I down where from cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory, honour to his name. <laughs>
bow together as we commit our time unto the Lord. O Father, we bow in your presence, and we say, O God, like the psalmist, what is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him. Who are we that the God of all glory would take notice of us, in so much that he would send his son down to this world to pay a price that he did not commit himself, but to absorb our wrath at Calvary, and that by his stripes we would be healed. And, O oh, Father, we thank you for your mercy, that you never needed us, but yet you looked down the pages of time, and you saw people even in Cranston's yard that would be lost in sin and destined for hell. And we know that you weren't willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and so that you have brought them tonight to the foot of the old river cross, and you're asking them to bring a, bring a response, to be like the thief, Lord, remember me. And Father, we pray that that would be the cry of a man or woman's heart tonight, Lord, remember me, Lord, save me. O oh God, we thank you that you're here, that you're able to save unto the uttermost all that come unto God by you. <laughs> We would ask you, Father, that you would move very powerfully and very definitely tonight. As Louise would sing, might this song be refreshing to you. Might it honor you and glorify you. Might our hearts even be built up as a result from it. Might hearts be challenged. Father, as David would speak, might utterance be given unto him. That he might open his mouth to speak boldly the message that you've led upon his heart. We know it's a tremendous privilege and a tremendous uh, responsibility to stand behind this desk and to preach the living word of God. And now come upon your child and enable him by your spirit to speak with a, with a boldness, with an unction, with a power, like thus saith the Lord. Father, we're looking to you tonight. We thank you as we cast our care and all of these anxieties of the meeting upon you. You've promised to be in control to take control and to honour honor and glorify your own name. And so we're looking to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we're so thankful tonight that Louise, uh, one of Heaven Bound's members, have come along from Balamina to sing to us on this stage. I'm going to ask Louise to come and bring her first two pieces. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the invitation to be here this evening. Um, where's my cap? Oh, God, there it's there. Um, it's lovely um, to be here, and it's lovely to be singing about the blood of Jesus Christ. And the first piece I'm going to sing is called Thank You for the Blood, because it's been applied in my life. Has it been applied in yours? I was a wretch. I remember who I was I was lost, I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the Jesus, you have saved. 
place Laid inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days But you walked to right out again Now death has no sting Life has no
that Jesus paid for us his wounds in his side the nail pierced hands being left by his father to die upon a cross he did it for you and he did it out of love and that is why this pulpit will never tire of speaking about Calvary because Jesus is still the answer and Jesus is still the answer that you need to accept and to embrace you need to reach out tonight with open arms and to ask him into your life while there is still time and accept his love that he bore towards you at Calvary. And as we often say from even this pulpit, we are here to help you. Please reach out to us. You've got our numbers on the sheet. Phone us at any time or call in with us at our houses or wait behind. We would love you to meet the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that your life would be changed for time and for all of eternity. We are just so pleased that you have come here tonight. And for those who have come really over these uh, past months and even over these past year and so forth, we really deeply appreciate it. Your attendance has been um, 
has been a thrill just to see each Sunday to look down, whether that was in the snow, whether that was in uh, perhaps the rain or wind, you've stuck with us and we really appreciate it and it's been an encouragement to us. The board of the church has decided that next Sunday will be our last drive-in service. It had to come to an end sometime and so after next Sunday we'll be moving back into the church. We will be keeping the same time at 6.30pm just to accommodate families and so do keep that in mind and make a special effort uh, next Sunday at 6.30pm when Gordon Quinn will be along to, to sing to us. And on Wednesday is our Bible study and prayer time. As often said, the prayer meeting is the boiler room of the church and that is why we ask you to come and join with us as we cry on to God even for this nation. Lifeliners will be uh, at, on Friday at 7 p.m. Quest then is at 7, 7.30 p.m. on Saturday and that is for 10 to 14 year olds and Philippa Parker will be singing to us. We will, or not singing to us, speaking to us. She can sing if she wants to but I'm pretty sure she'd probably rather speak than sing. Um, she will be speaking to us. We'll be having s'mores and hot chocolate and games and so if you know someone that's 10 to 14 and reach out to them with the invitation of coming to Quest. Everyone's welcome, and we'll deeply appreciate that. Sunday school is at 10.40 a.m., and then our Sunday morning worship service is at 11.30 a.m., and then, as I said, back out here again at 6.30 for our final drive-in service. As mentioned this morning, we intend to have a mission on starting November the 14th with our brother John Weir. Now, we believe very much that we need God to work in this generation. We need God to move. And that is why we are calling uh, new tower special times of prayer for this incoming mission, starting this Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. And we do ask you to join with us for this, and we will be really crying on to God that he would come and that he would move in this generation. So that's 10.30 uh, a.m. And... Uh, isn't that on Zoom or Zoom? Yes. Zoom at 10.30 and the link will be put out on the WhatsApp feed. Just before Louise comes to sing to us again, we're going to sing our, our second hymn. There's a wideness in God's mercy. Uh, whenever I see this hymn, it reminds me of a man, not from this locality, but that he was one day uh, far from God, and this hymn came to him, that there's a wideness in God's mercy. And as he was driving it broken, was he, because he realized even though he was a, a great sinner, that Jesus was a great saviour. And that no matter what sin he had committed, that God in his mercy was willing to forgive him. And he cried unto God for salvation and he was saved. And so I want to say to you tonight, unsaved person, there's a wideness in God's mercy. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've committed, the Lord is able to save you forgive you and to set you free and so we're going to sing this as as well
Louise comes to sing. Just to make mention again, as we go back into the church, that it will be transmitted uh, on that on that Sunday evening. We transmitted out into the car park, so perhaps you're still shading, you feel uncomfortable about coming into the building, and you can still sit out in your car and listen to the service. Okay, thank you, Louise. <coughs>
Come on to me and I'll give you rest. Well, thank you very much, Louise, for uh, travelling and singing uh, for us tonight. Uh, those beautiful pieces, uh, thank you so much. And it's uh, uh, great to be uh, amongst you again uh, in, in the last of our, of our drive-ins. It uh, certainly has been uh, a blessing uh, to all of us. And certainly, as I have uh, shared uh, in the few meetings that have been here, um, it's hard to believe it's been... Uh, over a year, uh, but it really has been such a, a privilege uh, to share uh, here uh, at, the, the, at the drive-in meetings and they have been really blessed uh, and it has been tremendous. But we're coming tonight not as a matter of formality or not as a matter that we just do it because we're, we have this uh, venue here. Uh, and just as a matter of principle that we come on a Sunday evening. But we are here this evening to share to you and to tell you uh, that Jesus loves you and that he died for you and that your soul would not be lost. And that is the thrust of these meetings, to share and to tell you uh, the tremendous news of the gospel that Jesus saves. And... As I have said in other evenings, if only we were to really understand the brevity and the reality of each soul that hangs in the balance of eternity, well, our thinking would certainly be different, wouldn't it? And as these meetings draw to a close, there is a solemnity with that, isn't there? And for some of you that have been coming perhaps week after week, and perhaps still unsaved, Still no change. Still you haven't realised that Jesus died for you. Well let me tell you this evening as we come to God's word and we're turning to John chapter 3. A very very familiar passage of scripture. John chapter 3 and verses 1 to 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now here is the reply of Jesus, and you'll find it in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb, his mother's womb, and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. And amen. If we were never to say another word tonight, it's in this passage, isn't it? And we know that the Lord will bless the public reading of his word. Let us have a word of prayer together before we turn to this precious passage of scripture. 
Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank thee, Lord, for your grace in each and every one of our lives that has brought us to this very point. And Father, we would pray tonight as we come to this precious Word of God, Father, that you would indeed help us tonight to see eternal things in their true reality. Oh, Father, we pray that man's, man's voice, as it were, and man's portrayal would be completely silent. But, Father, that we would hear from the Spirit of the living God that for those in this gathering tonight who do not know thee, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that tonight that they would realise and understand and know that they must be born again. We pray this in our Saviour's precious and ever worthy name. Amen. Well, this is a familiar passage, isn't it? Many people could turn to John 3 and recite many things, many verses. But you know what they say? Familiarity sometimes can breed contempt. We can get used to these things. We can get used to John 3. We can get used, get used to Nicodemus. We can get used to the term that you must be born again. And John records for us here in this chapter, Jesus Christ's discourse or his discussion with this man, Nicodemus. These first seven verses are tremendous, aren't they? And it gives us the discourse, the discussion between Nicodemus and the Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus, as many of you know, was a scholar. He was no dozer, I can tell you. He was a very, very intelligent man. John 3 and 10 tells us that Jesus answered and saith unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Nicodemus, in our language, was an academic. A very, very intelligent man. Verse 3 tells us that there was a man of the Pharisees. That gives us something of his pedigree or something of his standing uh, at that particular time. Named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Here was a man, academic, would have known the Old Testament. The first five books of the Old Testament. He would have knew the Pentateuch. He would have knew many of these verses, verse by verse, and entirely in his memory. A very, very religious, religious, upstanding individual. He was a ruler of the Jews, as we have said. He was a member, scholars tell us, of the Privy Council. A member of the great Sanhedrin, and all the privileges that that would have brought all the people would have looked up to Nicodemus. He was a ruler. He was an academic. He was someone of high standing. Very, very <coughs> religious. He was a man of authority in Jerusalem. He knew the law of Moses, as we've said, inside out. Very, very religious upstanding individual. And of course, Nicodemus would have known the law. He would have known the Old Testament. He would have known that God, in his sovereignty, was going to send a Messiah that would save the world. However, he was attracted to Jesus. Of course, these Pharisees and the Sanhedrin completely rejected the teachings of Jesus. Their Messiah would not come to a lowly stable in Bethlehem. Their Messiah would not come born of a virgin, as they would have thought. However, Nicodemus, this man, religious man, was attracted to Jesus through the miracles that he did, perhaps, 
in the preceding chapter, in chapter 2 of John's Gospel. There was an attraction. There was something that Nicodemus was hungering after. Though religious, though he knew the teachings of the Old Testament, Nicodemus wanted to know more of Jesus. More of the doctrines that he spoke of. More of the teachings of Jesus. There was a a drawing of Nicodemus to Jesus Christ. Of course, those of us who know the word of God know that drawing, don't we? It was the spirit of the living God was drawing Nicodemus to this Christ. The one that people called a heretic. And eventually they thought would take his life. But verse 2 tells us the same, speaking of Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night. And saith unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. That's how he addressed Christ. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, and that's very interesting. It would have been difficult for Nicodemus to come by day, wouldn't it? Jesus, this man that was coming, saying that he was the Son of God, saying that he was the Messiah... Creating so much anger amongst the Jews, the Pharisees, and the Sanhedrin. And this man, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night. Under the darkness of night, he came to Jesus. The Pharisees hated Jesus. They tried to stone him. And ultimately they, as they thought, they executed him. He came when no one could see. He was zealous. He felt convicted. Wanting to know the truth. And dear people this evening. You may be here and you may be religious. You may be someone that is religious and maybe you're confirmed. You're baptized and you know your Bible (coughs) inside out. And yet there's a drawing for you to come to hear the truth. There is a void within each of us that longs for the truth. That longs for stability. That longs for something that is higher than they Something that they can cling to. And many people try to cling and grasp for something when it comes in the event of death, perhaps. Even though they're religious. Even though they attend their church. They still know that there's something, something there that they don't have. And it was was the same with Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews, as we've said. He was a member of the Privy Council. He was in the Sanhedrin. He knew the Old Testament inside out. And yet he'd come to one whom his friends and colleagues hated. But he wanted to know the truth. And dear friends, this evening... We are here, and it is my privilege, and it is my responsibility to tell you the truth. That you must be born again. Nicodemus was concerned about his soul, his spiritual welfare. He was concerned. But Jesus, as we read in verse 3, replied straight to the point. 
And we'll read it again. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, who knew his theology, well versed in theological things, and to hear Jesus saying to him that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This would have been a foreign language to Nicodemus. And maybe it's a foreign language to you this evening. And maybe you're familiar with this term born again. If we are ever speaking to someone or someone who is religious, they will say to you, oh, you must be one of those born again Christians. You must be one of those born again people. This term born again creates Desperate controversy. It splits the hairs. This term born again. But dear people this evening. Jesus Christ coming from his very lips. And penned on this sacred scripture by John himself. He said to Nicodemus, as I say to you, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except you be born again, You cannot and you will not see the kingdom of God. There is no shady ground. There is no middle ground. There is no beating around the bush. Except you be born again. It's a biblical term. And it's a term that Christ used. So you would do well to take heed to this term. Because this term and being born again is the only thing that will bring you to heaven. What does it mean. To be born. Again. Many of you will, hear, will have heard of Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin. A great statesman. And a great inventor. But he was also. A correspondent of many famous people. With letters. He was a pro prolific. Letter writer and he received and wrote to people all over the world one day he received what was the most important letter that would ever reach his death it was a letter from the well known evangelist George Whitfield here's what he said he said to Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin I find that you grow more and more famous in the learned world, as you have made much progress investigating the mysterious use of electricity, I now humbly urge you to give diligent heed to the mystery of the new birth. It is most important study, and it will richly repay you. And dear people, this evening, we can get entangled in many things. We can get entangled even with church. We can get entangled with religion. We can get entangled with church attendance. And we can have discussions with people about God and about church attendance. And even biblical things. But when it comes right to the point, when it comes to being born again, why is it that that's the term that creates the controversy and creates one's back to go against the gospel? 
Why is that? My dear friends, this is one. And it's in our text. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There are countless multitudes around the throne this very evening. Worshipping the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Why are they there? Because they were born again. There are sadly multitudes in a lost eternity this evening. In hell. And why are they there? I ask you the question. Because they were not born again. Let me ask you this evening. Are you born again? And if that question upsets you. Or angers you. Or unsettles you. Well my dear friend this evening is a sure sign. That you are not born again. Verse 4 tells us that Nicodemus saith unto him. And here's the question Nicodemus asked. And we would do well to understand where Nicodemus was coming from. This was new language for Nicodemus. He said in verse 4. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus was saying, well, how can you be born again? Can you enter into your mother's womb and be born again from that? And being the patient teacher, Jesus was, went even further to explain the new birth. And he said in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. To be born of water is to be born physically. Each and every one of us have been born in water, haven't we? But to be born of the spirit means to be born again that's the difference that's the crux just as there are two parents in our physical birth so there are two parents in our spiritual birth and stay with me here the two parents in our spiritual birth just as we needed two parents For our physical birth is the Spirit of God, which Jesus speaks of in verse 5. So we need the Spirit of God and we need the Word of God. As we read in James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will begot he us with the Word of truth, which we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Warren Wearsbury commented that the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and when the sinner believes, imparted to him or her is the life of God. Christ here was not teaching of water baptism. And this is where a misinterpretation comes from this verse. Where many people believe that that if they're born of water or if they're baptized in water, that is the justification of their new birth. Dear people, this evening, that is wrong and that is terrible theology. For us to be born of water is to be born physically. But more importantly, for us to see the kingdom of God, we need to be born 
of the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus was saying here. To be born again of the Spirit of God. I want to ask you this evening. Are you born again? Have you been born of the Spirit of the living God? Have you came to a point in your life where the glorious gospel has shone into your heart and you have realized that I am a sinner and I am undone before a holy and a righteous God and that Jesus loved me so much that he died on the cross for me. And for those of us who are born again, we have been given a new life where the old things have passed away and all things have become new. We have new appetites. We have new judgments. We have new opinions. We have new tastes. We have new desires. Why? Because we have been born again. We cannot patch an old building or our lives by our efforts. The building must be flattened and a new foundation laid. Born again. Just like an ugly caterpillar is born again to a beautiful butterfly. It takes on a new existence. It takes on a new meaning. To be born again. Why does this term create so much controversy? Why is it so difficult for people to come to this point? Because there's a devil there. And he's interested. And he wants your soul. That is the bottom line. The greatest miracle that can be known to man. Is the miracle of the new birth. It aids us to love those who are unlovable. To love light rather than darkness. To hate sin. And to love God. Even though in our own nature we love sin. And we hate God. And yet the miracle of the new birth. Invokes to us. That we hate our sin. And we love God. How is this possible? Is it baptism? Is it confirmation? Is it church attendance? No, not at all. It is what our sister was singing in her first song. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you have remission of sin? To aid you. To be born. Again. Human birth involves travail. The ladies amongst that will tell us. And we know. Physical birth is difficult isn't it? Sorrow. And all of those things. And it's exactly the same with being born from above. It took sorrow. It took travail. It took the batterings and the bruisings of the Son of the living God so that you could leave tonight knowing that you are born again of the Spirit of God. Jesus had to travail on our behalf going through the anguish, going through the wrath of God that you can call unto him tonight and to be born again. Birth involves a future. A newborn baby has no past, have they? Has no convictions by their actions. And just to be born again, your past is forgotten completely and utterly. 
And so far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a newborn babe has no past. Christ looks on you when you're born again as though you never sinned. That you have no past. And you have been justified. He can give you a robe of righteousness. Your name can be written in heaven. And when you draw your last breath. You can enter into the presence of the living God. All because why? You're born again. And if you can't truly say that I am born again. Of the spirit of the living God. My dear friend this evening. Let me tell you. With all the heaviness in my heart. If you are not born again this evening. You are not for heaven. You are destined. For a lost eternity. With the Bible clearly calls. Hell. That place. Of torment. But dear friend this evening, we are here to tell you that Jesus loves you and that he died for you. And we're here to warn you and to tell you that you must be born again. Nicodemus was a Jew born into God's covenanted people. He wasn't a Samaritan. He wasn't a Gentile. And yet he was interested in to be born again. Interested in what that meant. My dear friends this evening. As we close in this service. I want to say to you and to plead with you. And to answer the question clearly within your heart. Are you born again? Are you? Are you born again? Have you accepted Christ and his finished work for you in Calvary? Or are you depending on your own self-righteousness? Maybe even baptism. Maybe even confirmation. Maybe even Attendance to church or paying into your church. Oh dear people this evening. Those things as good as they are. They'll take you straight to hell. Oh they will. There's not one person I could say in here this evening. Who was like Nicodemus. Who would have been as righteous as him. And devoted to God as him. As he thought. And yet he longed. And he was interested in being. Born again. Are you born again? Are you? Having come to these meetings. Is it crystal clear? Except a man or woman. Be born again. He or she cannot say the kingdom of God. I trust that you realize tonight that you must be born again and cry unto God for salvation tonight. Even in that car, whatever pride you may have or whatever preconceived notions that you may have, lay them aside and accept Christ tonight. Accept him while he, you may. Trust him. And be born again. We all know too well there's been sudden death. Even in this very earth here. <coughs> of Lee. Life's short. And it's our cry to you this evening. That you must be born again. Because Jesus loves you. Oh, he loves you. Let us close in a word of prayer.
our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you for the inerrant, infallible Word of God. We thank thee, Lord, for its separate page. And Father, for this discussion between the Lord Jesus Christ and Nicodemus telling him that he must be born again. And Father, we pray in this gathering tonight for those who remain in their sin, that they would realize that you love them and that you died for them. And when you were hanging on the cross of Calvary, that they were on your mind. Oh, Father, we pray that you would give deciding clarity and grace tonight that people would understand and know categorically that they're born again. Father, we thank you for your presence with us tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you would indeed save those who need to be saved. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us in our Saviour's precious and ever worthy name. Amen. <coughs> Please remember that if we can be of help to you, please speak to us. We would even call to see you, to point you to Christ and his finished work on Calvary. Thank you so much for listening tonight.